1963 and 1964 saw the template of future adventures for our avenging duo. The change in personnel saw to this due to fresh blood, where the average age of writers were mid to late twenties. Now this ensured that the actual show achieved a certain boldness and a whole brand new outlook for the series. Where at first the rudimentary spy shenanigans were top heavy and the more avant-garde adventures were light, this season saw a complete reversal as out of the woodwork came the diabolical masterminds. The Avengers were not just now protecting a delegate or two, nor winning over a smaller syndicate of villainry. This time around, the Avengers were saving the world for Queen and Country, and for us, and doing it with such style and quirky panache. <laughs> Season 3 saw the Avengers achieving what we look back on as cult status. It was a phenomenal hit, achieving number one in the television ratings. Fan mail was received by the Sackville and was becoming unmanageable. Mrs. Gale and Mr. Steed were riding high. The show now blended a modernist and traditional style. A kind of synergy echoed in Harold Wilson's white heat of technology speech. Behind the scenes though, things did get a little shaky, as at the end of season two, Patrick McNee and Honor Blackman didn't at one stage even know their contracts were being renewed. Iris Productions, a subsidiary production company of ABC Television, who were in charge of the production of The Avengers, looked at costings and an eyebrow was raised. The financial director, looking at the primary production costs, and discovered that only on two occasions had the Avengers went under or equalised within the allocated budget. Iris Productions' main concern was the proposals to increase the two main stars' salaries they believed that they simply couldn't afford both the stars together and wanted a decision to be made as to which star to drop, on a Blackman or Patrick McNee. If it was decided to keep them both, then the budget had to increase. ABC Television, once they received this proposal, within one week granted £5,000 as an increase for um, the episodes and uh, per episode, and both McNee and Blackman had a renewal in contract. ABC Television also had d demands for the show going forward by requesting a further inclusion of a male lead to prevent the show from what they termed as getting a bit hag-ridden. Steed obtained a superior called Quilpy, played by Paul Whitson Jones, who appeared in the episode the outside-in man, whose bureau was uh, secretly stationed at the back of a butcher's shop where he passed prime cuts of meat between briefing the agents. Quilpie's typical Avengers line of... However, if you'd like to come with me to the back, yes sir, I might be able to oblige you, sir. ...is classic Avengers stuff. Quilpy also was a nod to Steed Superior called Mother, who became a mainstay in the later Tara King episodes. The success of this season was down to the Avengers family and the way the production team and writers cooperated with an emphasis on improvement, whether script or style, but always with wit and charm. 
The writing talent was phenomenal, as uh, John Bryce, the producer, and the story editor, Richard Bates, son of H.E. Bates, seemed to focus on the uh, best new writers available, scribing their um, episodes. Writers such as Roger Marshall, Malcolm Hulk, and Brian Clements submitted scripts, and it's these writers that produced some of the best for this season. There was always a focus on high tension without earnestness, with a firm vein of wisecracking running through it, so the viewer would not be totally bewildered when something totally audacious cropped up. Or something eminently implausible. Their input was valued, and so they were invited along to the readings, the dry runs, and the studio recordings. Such involvement of all involved paid off. The team were unremitting when they were shepherding their own audience research and valued every criticism or idea for improving things for the better, producing exquisite nuggets of viewing entertainment, which was ultimately the end result. A toast. Pax Imperium et res secundi. Oh! Ah! Oh. Hello, Bruno. Is this what you call a bacchanalia? Oh. Get that man! <laughs> The Avengers now reveled in the fresh, kooky approach, the blithe qualities that was in some of the episodes, and simply refused to take it earnestly. And what the Avengers became was sharp, refined, and highly captivating. However, when Steed was referred to as a marshmallow scarlet pimpernel by a national paper, and audience research felt that the character of John Steed was overstepping the mark with his levity and his banter with Kathy Gale, almost becoming Kathy Gale's stooge, the producers um, decided to up Steed's ferocity, which originally made him so popular with Avengers fans. This change can be seen in the story The Man with Two Shadows, where Steed interrogating his prisoner, suspected of being a uh, conditioned counter-spy, pulls away his chair and when on the floor swiftly administers a kick in the ribs. Hey, was I ever a piano player? A good one. <laughs> You used to play Brahms very well. And Mendelssohn. Brahms and Mendelssohn? Brahms and Mendelssohn? Mendelssohn! Er drückt von Bellet aus! Er muss erschossen werden! Sie flucht doch, tut er! Don't tell the general I played Mendelssohn! Get up. Get up! Sit down. Name. Name. Here, Dr. Kaplan. Name? Ah! Where will I see you? Where were you born? Hanover! Nope. New York. You're still lying? Oh, I can't. I can't. Ah! 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 I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Stick me to London. That's better. 
It's also of note for this episode that the set designs by Paul Bernard of the Holiday Camp are pretty similar to the series that came after it, The Prisoner. Was this an influence? The set design and direction in season three, it should also be mentioned, was uh, much more and apparently more experimental than it had ever been in the series. Kathy Gale's character um, also changed, making her less cool as a cucumber, and um, she just had more warmth in this series. She was allowed to fall in love at the end of the uh, second series in the story Six Hands Across a Table. I love it. It's been a marvellous week. Why don't you stay on? I could hardly do that. Well, why not? I always do what I want, I always have. I need you, Rose. On your terms? On your terms, if you like. We could get your man Seabrook to arrange the contract. I arrange my own contracts. Even locking lips with the uh, tycoon that she fell in love with. But the new producer, Bryce, um, forbidded this until the story The Little Wonders. In this, the pucker-up ban is lifted as Steed and Kathy finally get to smooch. What is here? I uh, <clears throat> hope I didn't wake you. Just so long as you didn't wake the bishop. He found you here, there'd be trouble. Hello, my dear. I thought for me to call. You must be off your rocker, Johnny. Birds ain't allowed. Oh, Aunt Harry, you're just jealous. That is right. We ain't supposed to have nobody contact us while we're in session. You won't report me, I'm counting on my support. However, Steed wasn't exactly Steed, so it doesn't really count. Viewers were still sometimes teased by what happens after the credits roll. The two characters um, were still different from each other, and this was maintained by the producer John Bryce, and he hit this on the head with a reappraisal of the character's role for this series. In his reappraisal, he mentions that, for example, Steed says assassination, opposed to Kathy calling it murder. Steed's choice clearly is more acceptable of this callous act. Fascinating collection. I wouldn't if I were you. They don't appear to have sent any keys. Really? I suppose Madame Restraint trusted me much. Oh, your principal. <laughs> I got something for you. It's a small gesture of my appreciation. The spoils of victory? That's very valuable. You always manage to win something, don't you, Steve? <laughs> Whatever anybody else has lost, you pick up your perks and off you go. Well, I'm an anthropologist, not one of your gang. And if you want my help again, you'd better have a very good reason. Is that the law? No. You're using my experience to cover your indolence. Indolence? If it hadn't been for me, you'd still be in that tiger's cave. Well, at least I'd know exactly what I was up against. In season three, Steed's clothes became even more neo-Edwardian. Elegantly embroidered waistcoats and intertwined pinstripe were acceptably and uh, spiritedly clashed with the a la mode of drainpipe trousers. And of course, we mustn't forget that marvellous bowler hat. Kathy also, alongside her leather ensemble, went oriental or militaristic, especially um, the Napoleonic period, um, which was echoed in her hats and um, uh, her sporting jackets and fobs and boots and suits and waistcoats and jackets. And these also had a candor of the Orient of the Chinese line. Frederick Stark was recruited to give flair to Honor's wardrobe and does wonders, but because he was once a chairman of the London Fashion House Group, is of little surprise into what he achieved. He created exquisite garments for 15 episodes, 
of the uh, 26 uh, Kathy Gale stories. Designs were in fact previewed on the 29th of October 1963 at the Garrison Le Ambassadeurs Club at London's Park Lane for an Avenger wear fashion show. The Avengers definitely set the trend and by no means did they follow it. The leather thing had also began to become wearing for Honor Blackman by, although jokingly, being offered outside by mostly pissed up men for a fight, proving then as now men hate their masculinity being threatened. Honor also had a few issues with lewd fan mail, some of it very cringy indeed. To be honest, uh, st and statistically around 80% were fine, but there was that 20% which were kept from the Ms. Blackman. Blackman said of this, it created some rather strange invitations. Some very strange invitations. Some people actually imagined that with all the leather and boots I wore, I also carried a whip. I was frequently asked to attend some strange parties, provided I carried my whip. I never went, of course. However, Honor Blackman certainly proved she could handle a situation herself. For example, to promote the Avengers, Blackman went to a live talk show in the Midlands in the UK prior to broadcast. She asked the host, by all accounts he was a bit of a twat, what sort of questions would be asked um, by him. And uh, he responded to her that he never revealed what questions he would be asking, which immediately put Honor Blackman on edge. During the broadcast, and completely out of the blue, the host asked, Tell me, Miss Blackman, how does it feel to be half man, half woman? Without being phased, Honor Blackman bent forward in a dress displaying an ample bosom and replied, Which half are you referring to? The scarlet-faced interviewee continued to fluff his lines admirably. Nice one, Honor Blackman. In season three, we learn that Kathy Gale is now on the Secret Service's payroll and gets digs in Primrose Hill, moving closer to her partner in crime, John Steed. The plot lines of season three were at the best of times outlandish. This is a moment of history, Mrs. Gale. A bizarre moment. Who would have thought? Quiet country village. I had heard the English were eccentric, but this, you know that is, Mrs. Gale, device. Can immobilize anything from a toy train to a nuclear warhead. It went like a dream. Yes, so I you, understand. You, you, you should have seen her. Kill her. Good evening, gentlemen. Man with Two Shadows looked at double jeopardy with agents being brainwashed. November 5 deals with nuclear Armageddon. 
and the grandeur that was Rome concerned bacteriological warfare as a diabolical mastermind threatens to release bubonic plague. There's also the story um, Mandrake, where, um, which is rather surreal, and it's where out-of-town millionaires end up in a graveyard full of arsenic. No one can detect how they were murdered, as it all looks like they were poisoned. It was in this story that Anna Blackman, during a fight scene, and not recognising her own strength, knocked out a stuntman cold. The Avengers faced head-on arch-villains and deranged geniuses from a, ba- from a Bond film rather than a formulaic spy series. It's also of note that the episode called The Gilded Cage could in fact be interpreted as a kind of dry run for the film Goldfinger. Brian Clemens uh, penned three awesome adventures for our duo. One of them is called Don't Look Behind You, um, which, which saw Kathy um, as a sitting duck for a stalker out for retribution. This was remade later as a Diana Rigg colour episode called The Joker. Brief for Murder saw Steed supposedly murdering Kathy, and Dress to Kill was a story where a New Year's Eve party aboard a train becomes littered with the revelers' corpses. The Charmers saw a charm school used as a cover for a training camp for foreign enemy agents. Look out also for the div- divine Fenella Fielding in this one. And the episode The Charmers was also remade as an Emma Pill story called The Correct Way to Kill. And we mustn't also forget the story Build a Better Mousetrap which saw a quirky little slice of sci-fi drama where the Avengers encounter two dear old ladies who have created an electronic jamming device, unleashing complete calamity in a modest hamlet. There's also a story that I remember that I thoroughly enjoyed, which was called The Ringer, and this also saw brainwashing, creating mistrust and suspicion amongst the ranks of the civil service. Although the episodes The Secrets Broker, The Nutshell and Concerto were espionage fair, all had a beguiling foible at the denouement. Most have these wonderful, bizarre twists void from the majority of the previous season stories. A pinnacle for the Avengers was in 1964, and the series won the Independent Television Personalities of 1963 in the Variety Club of Great Britain Annual Awards held at London's Dorchester Hotel. The Nadir, unfortunately, was that after two seasons of Avenging, Kathy Gale departed in the last season story, 
the lobster quadrille. You look really wonderful, my dear. Thank you. Look, I've hung you in the place of honor. Yes, very touching. I told you, a few days complete relaxation and you'll be as right as red. How are the burns, by the way? Oh, only superficial. Good, I'm delighted to hear it. Because I've got something for you. To replace the wardrobe you lost in the, uh, in the line of fire. Oh, that's nice of you, Steve. Hey, who told you? Told me what? That I'm taking a holiday. Are you? Yes, I leave tomorrow. I'm off to the Bahamas. No, what a coincidence. As a matter of fact, there's just a um, little bit of trouble out there. That's right, it, it's, it's not the least dangerous. No, 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 of course not. And as you're going to be out there anyway, pussyfooting along those sun-soaked shores. You thought I might do a little investigating. That's right. What do you say? Goodbye, Steve. Eh? Hey. That's what I say. Goodbye. But that isn't asking too much. Oh, yes, it is. You see, I'm not going to be pussyfooting along those sun-soaked shores. I'm going to be lying on them. Not pussyfooting. I must have been misinformed. Or could it be that Kathy Gale changed her name to Pussy Galore? Ah, that's something we shall never know. Lobster Quadrille used the, the last story used the ultimate in fantastical literature as its thematics. The show throughout the series entered the fantastical with its outre plotlines and idiosyncratic characters as the Avengers now were about to heighten its profile further. And in 1965, it was going to become a globally successful era for the series. The Avengers was about to enter its golden age, a renaissance of the uh, capricious. Patrick McNee was devastated that Honor Blackman had left, however a new relationship was to be formed with another feminine icon as Blonde became Brunette and the Palladio jazzy period of Kathy Gale paved way for monochrome mod.